So yo, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome everyone and uh, just say what oh for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate you all taking the time out of your day, uh, you know, to join us for these presentations. But I think it's really awesome for us to have this opportunity to come together and to share knowledge and, uh, you know, to just continue to fellowship with one another, uh, even though, uh, you know, we, we can't physically be together right now. So I just want to say, what do I, I really appreciate you guys uh, signing on. Ordinarily, we have the legislative update on the second Thursday of the month, uh, but that is going to be moved uh, to the 22nd. So they will be on the fourth Thursday. So um, Brad Wagner was scheduled for that day, but he has graciously uh, switched days with um, with uh, Kim Teehee, and he has joined us today for this talk on Cherokee spirituality. And, uh, you know, I just want to say what, oh, Brad, you know, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, Cherokee spirituality is something that, um, you know, I've given presentations on before. I've heard a lot of presentations on it, and it is not a, um, you know, one size fits all, you know, um, topic or, um, you know, and I, I really appreciate the discussion that we are able to have when we do talk about um, Cherokee spirituality, because we get to hear everyone's experience. Um, you know, without discounting that or without, you know, um, putting each other down. And that's what I really love about our people is that we are inclusive, we are accepting, and, um, you know, we are helpful to one another. So, um, you know, I just want to say again, you know, what old Brad, um, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about this. And, um, you know, so I look forward to learning right along with everyone else. So without further, uh, further ado, go ahead and uh, take it away, Brad. So Abraham, I'm going to open us up in prayer uh, like we like to do with all of our events. We like to uh, go to the creator in prayer. And so I'm going to say a prayer and I'll ask you all to just pray in whatever way uh, you see fit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and all your blessings, God. We just ask you would be with us through this time and uh, help us to learn uh, what we need to learn and help us to open our ears, open our hearts, Lord, to uh, what you would have us to know. We just ask that you would uh, help us to have good fellowship, good questions, and help me to uh, say what I need to say and get the point across that I'm trying to make. Pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Brad Wagnon. Um, if you haven't met me before, um, I work for CCO as the Community Outreach Coordinator. Uh, been to quite a few of the at-large events and uh, been all over uh, the reservation here to different organizations. And I see a lot of names in the in the attendees that I recognize, a few that I don't. But uh, hopefully, uh, I'll get to meet you soon. Um, if you you don't know I'm a uh, people person so this virtual thing is kind of different for me I like to be able to talk to people face to face uh, give my presentations face to face and hopefully we can do that soon uh, but I appreciate Abraham asking me to do this um, I've given this presentation several times uh, at large uh, and everybody has seemed to enjoy it so just before I start I want to say you know like Abraham said Cherokee sp spirituality means different things to different people. Um, and so what I'm going to be sharing with you today is, you know, my experience with Cherokee spirituality, some of the things that I've learned with a good bit of history and culture mixed in. Uh, you can't talk about Cherokee spirituality and about sacred things to Cherokees without talking about some of the uh, cultural, uh, familial clans, things like that. So I'm going to touch on all of that uh, in this presentation. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna share my screen, the presentation, and uh, the, the things that are on the slides are basically just things to keep me on topic, but uh, some people would probably, including me, probably rather look at the slides than look at my face the whole time. So here we go. So just a little bit about uh, my background before we get started. Um, yes, uh, uh, you heard my prayer at the beginning. I am a, a Christian, grew up in a Baptist church here in Cherokee County. 
uh, didn't necessarily grow up with the Cherokee traditions or the Cherokee ceremonies as part of my my family. But um, as I've grown older, I have began to explore those things for myself. Um, I've sat uh, with many Cherokee elders, including uh, Benny Smith, Chigesa, uh, and heard him talk several times. Uh, there's a lot of guys uh, uh, that at the different Cherokee stomp grounds that have taught me things. Uh, just I kind of soak things up like a sponge. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is some of those things that I've learned. Um, I taught Cherokee history, culture, and language at Tahlequah High School for 10 years. And so uh, um, I, I have experience in teaching. And I've, like I said, for the past six years, I've traveled um, within the reservation and, and uh, outside the reservation doing presentations on multiple things, everything from Cherokee history to um, how to uh, run a good board meeting. So we're gonna get started with this presentation. Um, my first slide is just a quote. Uh, I can get it to go here. There we go. This is a quote from uh, Benny Smith. He's passed on, uh, he said a Cherokee prayer it is medicine. And if any of you have heard um, Benny Smith or his brother Carlson give a prayer, uh, it's more like they're telling you a story um, in their prayers and, and telling uh, things that we should do and the way that we should live our life. Um, so our one of Benny's things was, you know, our very words are our medicine. So Cherokee spirituality has been passed down mostly through oral tradition. Um, you're not going to find until uh, Crosland came out with his books, you're not going to find very many books on uh, Cherokee spirituality that are actually written by Cherokee people. Um, I've, re I've read Crosland's first book and I see there's a new one out. So I'd encourage people to, to look through those. Uh, there's a lot of things in there that, that I've been told and that, uh, uh, are good uh, ways to live. So our values, beliefs, and practices have been passed down through our stories. Uh, I also do uh, Cherokee children's books where I share uh, some of our stories. And so those things that we're supposed to do and are not supposed to do the way that we're supposed to live our lives are passed down through those stories. Uh, like I said, it's, it's very hard to find true spirituality in books. Um, you have to live it. It's that learned versus taught. You learn when you're living through things and, and having experiences versus being taught sitting in a classroom. And uh, it's kind of funny to say that since we're all sitting here, you know, watching me give this presentation. Uh, but uh, a lot of, of you that, you know, have lived these experiences uh, will understand what I'm saying. And I hope that those of you who haven't had an opportunity to do that, we'll get something out of this presentation and dive deeper into it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the end, about, about how to do that. So our origin stories um, are things that I, I share a lot when I'm out and about uh, talking. We have our creation story, of course, and then our uh, story, Land of the Great Turtles, that I uh, first heard from, from Benny that uh, is our origin story, uh, where we came from. So the creation story, how the world was made versus the origin story, where we came from. And then there's a very uh, uh, often told migration story. Um, I first heard it from Hastings Shade um, about uh, how we got to be where we are today. Um, and sometimes people call that the story of the four directions. We also have the story of the origin of, of fire. Uh, it's the picture that I've depicted here. The, the origin of fire says that, you know, our, our first fire was given to us um, by, the, by the thunder. Some people say by the creator uh, when they sent a bolt of lightning down to hit a sycamore tree that was out on an island. And uh, of course the fire is a very uh, important thing to us, sacred thing to us discuss that here in a bit. So our, our spirituality is connected a lot to our, uh, who we are as people. And 
So I always share this, especially with people that, that may or may not know. Um, our original name given to us by the creator is Anika Duwagi, uh, the people of Katua. Uh, that picture there is a picture of what is uh, left of our home uh, town, uh, Katua, uh, close to Cherokee, North Carolina. So the people of Katua are the people who rise above. Uh, Duwagi is a, is a direction, it's an action. It's, it means we're continually rising above it, continually adapting uh, and uh, being coming out on top. And we, we do that, you can see by our history and by what's going on currently, that the Cherokee people always come out on top. Uh, we, we have a, a very adaptable tribe and very adaptable people and we can adapt almost any situation that's thrown at us we have and we will continue to do so so that's that's who we are as as Cherokee people very connected to our spiritual life so the the word that we give to the creator uh, basically means the one that provided us with everything that continues to provide us with everything some people call say the creator some people say god uh, to, to me, uh, as I said, this is my personal experience. To me, it's all the same being, all the same person, the, the person that gives us everything that we need. So uh, that that's another concept uh, in Cherokee spirituality is that we have this provider that gives us everything that we need. Another concept that you'll hear people talk a lot about in uh, Cherokee spirituality and ceremonial circles is to Yukta, uh, which basically has several translations, the way, the truth, the path. Uh, the way that it's been explained to me is this is the way that we live our lives. Uh, this is where we get, uh, find all those Cherokee community values. Like we're supposed to hold all people as sacred. You know, if, if somebody falls down we're not supposed to let go. All those different community values. And y'all have heard talks uh, from different people on community values. And do Yukta is the, the overall concept of being Cherokee and living uh, the right way as Cherokee people. So as not to leave anybody behind. Uh, so to treat everybody as if they are sacred, which they are. Uh, talk just a little bit just now about Cherokee community values. Um, I believe my next slide is going to uh, talk a little bit more about that. So when we talk about Cherokee spirituality, like I said, we can't talk about it and not talk about our values and about the way that we uh, live our lives historically and today. Uh, so our Cherokee values tell us that everyone has value. Um, everyone contributes and everyone is listened to. It was like Abraham was talking about at the beginning. It's great that we have this forum uh, where we can talk, uh, people can learn, people can ask questions, uh, and everybody's question is important and everybody's contribution is important. And this is the way that we've always been. Uh, I'll talk a little bit later about, you know, roles of different people in the tribe, roles of men, roles of women, uh, roles of elders, children, what everybody did. Everybody had a role and everybody had responsibilities. Um, I always say that, you know, if we could get everybody to follow these Cherokee values today, we would have a whole lot less problems than we do in the world right now. And, uh, I, I truly, truly believe that. Uh, we also can't talk about spirituality without talking about our language. Um, uh, our language is spiritual, spiritual, or our spirituality is is in our language. There's certain things in Cherokee that don't translate well to English. Um, we use our language. Uh, they use our language when they're making medicine uh, and different things like that. You don't speak in English when you're making medicine or when you're doing certain things, 
uh, at the ceremonial grounds. Um, also our philosophy, our way of life is built into our language. Um, and we don't have a word for goodbye. I know those of y'all that are Cherokee already know that. Uh, some of you may have not heard that before, but we don't ever say goodbye to each other, which tells me that you know, Cherokees believe in some sort of life after this that will continue uh, on our, our souls, our spirits, whatever you want to call it, will continue on and that we will see each other again. And that's uh, one of the reasons why it's so important that we continue to preserve our language and not only preserve it, but continue to use it and make it a living language, a changing language, uh, something that we use every day. And I'm, I, I know quite a bit of Cherokee uh, words. I can't speak in conversation very well, but I'm guilty too of not using it as much as I, as I could. And we just need to remember that our spirituality, our ceremonies, our religion, if you will, is is wrapped up in our language as well. And that's why it's very important that we keep that and keep learning and keep using our language. Uh, one of the things that's uh, being talked about more uh, than it used to be was that we do have uh, these, these wampum belts that have our teachings. Uh, they all tell a story they tell about how we should live and how we should treat each other. Uh, and some ceremonial grounds uh, have replicas of these belts that they use to teach. Um, I'm not sure where the original belts are. I'm not sure that a lot of people know that. Um, but they used to be brought out and, and talked about at the ceremonial grounds um, on a regular basis. And I, I have to admit that since uh, COVID, uh, I haven't been to any ceremonial grounds uh, again, and so I'm not sure, you know, if these belts are still being used. I know that there's some grounds that use uh, replicas in order to teach these laws and these, uh, these things. They're actually, I mean, they're treated like, basically like the Bible, um, if you want to compare it to something for, for Cherokee people. Quote from uh, Crosland Smith uh, says, many think we are honoring God, but we aren't. We have to start at square one again. And uh, I, I took this to heart because I'm somebody that had to start at square one. Like I said, I grew up in a Baptist church. Um, for the first 20 years, 21 years of my life, I didn't uh, know anything about Cherokee spirituality or Cherokee ceremonies. Uh, I moved away to Texas for a couple of years and then I came back to Tahlequah in part because I uh, missed home, but also in part because I had this desire within me to learn, you know, Cherokee language and to learn about my culture, a culture that I had basically taken for granted uh, before I left. And so I had to start at square one and I, uh, I was fortunate enough to meet some people that uh, are involved with one of the Cherokee ceremonial grounds and they invited me out. Um, and I went out, uh, you know, pretty regularly for three or four years um, and learned a lot from them and, and uh, started taking Cherokee language classes and, and things like that. And so I started at square one as somebody that didn't know anything about Cherokee culture, Cherokee language about 20 years ago. And uh, in those 20 years, there's a lot of people uh, that have helped me out, Crosland and Benny being two of those people and uh, uh, people from different Cherokee ceremonial grounds. And uh, I just uh, really thank those people for taking the time to show me. And I, I started taking, I took the uh, Cherokee Humanities course uh, that the Heritage Center offered uh, two or three times, uh, got the privilege of, of sitting in class with Hastings Shade uh, for a couple of those classes and some other Cherokee elders that uh, were helping basically teach the class, 
giving their stories and giving their opinions on different things. And, and that's where I uh, learned a lot about Hastings and about his, his stories. Uh, he has a lot of stories about Cherokee spirituality and about Cherokee history. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. Uh, of course, we can't talk about uh, spirituality without talking about our clans. Um, today, uh, some people don't know their clan, uh, but the clans are still used at the ceremonial grounds and at different places. Uh, there's seven Cherokee clans. Some people say we had more uh, a long time ago, but the clans that we know of today are, are these seven, the bird clan, or I mean the deer clan, the paint clan, wolf clan, bird clan, blue clan, wild potato, and the long hair clan. And a long time ago, you know, each of these clans had a, a responsibility. We talked a little bit about responsibilities earlier, uh, but within, you know, the Cherokee towns, uh, each clan had a responsibility and each clan had something that they were, you know, specialized in. Okay, so some some sacred things uh, to Cherokee people. Uh, of course, tobacco uh, is sacred. I've heard uh, Croslin talk a lot about tobacco and that, you know, in and of itself, the tobacco that we, we grow can be used as medicine without, you know, any, anything being done to it. You know, it's, it's medicine uh, in and of itself. And, you know, it's used as a vehicle for, for other medicine and, uh, in our story of our uh, origin story, Land of the Great Turtles, it talks about us bringing tobacco with us from that uh, island. Uh, it's a, he says it's a gift of the creator. It's already medicine. Uh, water is another thing. Uh, it's for spiritual cleaning, uh, wash away troubles. Uh, Cherokee people were always cleaner than their European counterparts when we encountered them because, you know, we went to water regularly, if not every day. Uh, so flowing water was always one of those things that uh, Cherokee people use for cleansing uh, and still is today. A cedar is a sacred plant. Um, it's burned at different times, the main time being uh, during the time of mourning uh, to clear away all spirits from the home and places where uh, people will be gathering uh, to celebrate the life of a loved one. Um, and I've gotten to experience that a few times that uh, was really very powerful to see, uh, see that done. And of course, uh, I think my next slide, uh, well, next slide is about ceremonial grounds. Um, as most people probably know, this, this isn't a picture of an actual uh, uh, stomp. This is a practice stomp that one of the grounds had. Uh, not really supposed to take pictures of, of the actual ceremony itself. Uh, so there's a, around seven ceremonial grounds in Oklahoma, uh, two in North Carolina. Um, and that number uh, may have changed since I've done this presentation, but uh, those are the ones that I know of. Um, so the fire uh, is at the center of our ceremonial grounds and it brings people in. Um, the fire is, is what makes, uh, you know, a ceremonial ground, a ceremonial ground. And the smoke from the fire uh, carries our prayers to the creator. It's one of the things that, you know, uh, even in my family, my, my grandmother was uh, on my mom's side was not Cherokee. She was born in Pennsylvania. And uh, one of the things uh, she always told me uh, when I was growing up was that, you know, she, she went to a ceremonial ground with my grandpa and she was scared. And uh, so that's kind of the, the thing that I had, you know, the people say that, you know, they worship the fire, but really the fire is just the vehicle, you know, but it's, it's, it's uh, the vehicle that we use to uh, get to the creator. And it's the, the thing that, that brings us all together and brings us all in. And after I started, you know, attending ceremonial grounds, I, I realized, you know, my grandma was just mistaken. Uh, there was nothing to be scared of. And uh, that 
the ceremonial ground that I attended the most. They're, you know, they're very welcoming to everybody that's Cherokee and and uh, even you know people that are non-Cherokee as long as they're invited in. Um, so there's several different types of, of dances. Of course, there's the stomp dance, which is uh, here in Oklahoma, you know, that's what we we have and we, you know, consider those stomp dances to be sacred events. Uh, there's also animal dances. Um, here in Oklahoma, those animal dances are more uh, of social uh, type occasions. There are, you know, some that have, you know, spiritual significance. And then there's the booger dance. The booger dance was a dance that was done mostly in the winter. And the uh, intention of, of the booger dance was to poke fun at uh, basically things that we were scared of. Uh, booger dances use masks to, uh, to replicate different kinds of people uh, like uh, white people or Spanish people or uh, different people like that. Also, they had booger masks that replicated uh, disease uh, like smallpox. So basically it was a way it's kind of, I kind of compare it to uh, today people watching scary movies. Um, we kind of watch scary, a lot of people kind of watch scary movies or read scary books, things like that to take their mind off the real uh, things that can harm us, you know, whether it's disease or whether it's accidents or thing, whatever people are scared of. And so uh, the Cherokee would use these uh, as a ceremony to to make fun of and ward off uh, these things that that could harm them. So this is uh, my uh, experience personally at Cherokee ceremonial grounds of the kind of the the schedule that things run on. And of course, this is going to be different probably for every ceremonial ground. Uh, this is just uh, the schedule for the one that I attended the most. And I intended for this, you know, to be for people who had never been to a ceremonial ground to kind of tell them uh, what's going on or what goes on. And so uh, most of the time uh, for me as just a, a participant, I didn't have any sort of leadership role or anything like that. This is what the, the stomp dance, the ceremonial ground uh, schedule would have been like for me. So I usually arrived on Friday evening. Um, usually there was a meal on Friday evening and most of the time on Friday, Friday night, uh, you would just kind of, kind of sit around and uh, there would be a, a dance on Friday night. It would be a, a shorter dance than the one on Saturday night, just to kind of get warmed up and get everybody going. Um, go to water uh, on Saturday morning. And there's different schedules for, for men and women at the ceremonial grounds. Um, after going to water, the, uh, the women would begin to prepare food for the day. Of course, the men most of the time would be fasting until the next dinner uh, on, on Saturday evening. Um, so the men would go in, they would prepare you know, the, the medicine person would prepare the medicine for the day and the men would prepare the, the ground uh, for the day, uh, which usually included, you know, cleaning up, uh, getting everything ready. Um, so there was uh, kind of a morning time uh, medicine and then afternoon ceremonies at some of the gatherings, uh, afternoon meetings. And then uh, there might be a stickball game sometimes. Sometimes the stickball games would be done you know, after the dance, just depend on, on the time of the year. But pretty much until dinner time, after all of the, the medicine was done and all the cleaning of the ground was done, then you just relax um, until uh, you took medicine in the evening, right before dinner. Um, and one of the things that I didn't include in here is before dinner, uh, you know, somebody would go around, usually the, the uh, people that kept the fire, the, the uh, they would go around and get food uh, from each of the camps and feed the fire before anybody else ate. The fire ate before anybody else. And so then after that, we would do dinner, uh, rest, prepare for the dance, get dressed in your best clothes and get ready to dance. Um, so the, the dance begins, uh, call for the people to come out 
uh, when the first star is able to be seen in the east. And Cherokee stomp dances go all night long. Uh, there's dancing, talking, uh, fellowship all throughout the night. And uh, then in the morning, like I said, sometimes uh, folks would play stickball, uh, go to water, uh, and then clean up and pack up. And then the medicine person would use what medicine was left to clean off the ground and go home. Um, there was a little bit of conversation um, earlier about uh, Christian folks practicing uh, stomp dance. Uh, I can tell you many times I stayed up all Saturday night and danced and went to church on Sunday morning. Uh, I have found nothing within you know Cherokee beliefs or within Christian beliefs that that uh, keep me from doing both. And uh, I really hope that people can see that we can all uh, participate in this as, as uh, our culture and keeping our traditions alive. So I want to talk a little bit about the roles of people. Uh, a lot of times people, you hear people talk about clan mothers or, or something to that effect, but uh, these people were really our grandmothers and our aunts and older women uh, that knew everything, uh, did everything, had the final say most times. Um, they were the ones that knew you know, where to gather the medicine. They were the ones that knew how to doctor people. Uh, a couple of my coworkers and I were talking about that this morning. Um, so the grandmothers and the older women held all the knowledge um, for their families. And that's the reason they were so respected and so beloved and, and still are today. I used to tell my students that my students would ask me, you know, how do I know what clan I'm in and different things like that. And I would say, go to the oldest woman on your mother's side of the family and ask whether that's your aunt, whether that's your grandmother, whether that's your mother, you know, ask questions and they were uh, still are very revered in our Cherokee ceremonial life and in our Cherokee culture. This kind of goes along with that. Uh, elders are the wisest, always valued, always consulted, treated with utmost respect. respect. Um, Cuffley, uh, full human beings, people that have experienced everything and the rest of us are just trying to get there. Uh, trying to have all that knowledge. So the traditional roles of men, um, and no, I'm not talking about what people call gender roles. I'm talking about the traditional roles of, of Cherokee men before, you know, contact, before, uh, uh, before we con contacted European people. And, uh, the reason there was so much conflict between us is, is what European men did and what Cherokee men did uh, crossed over in some ways, but in other ways they were completely opposite one another and the same goes for women. Uh, Cherokee men were the hunters, the warriors. Uh, they were teachers of their, the Cherokee boys um, of how to grow up to be a Cherokee man. Uh, the hunters offered prayers for a life taken. Um, and if you know the origin of disease and medicine, you know that those uh, prayers and that respect at some point stopped being offered to uh, nature. And that's why how we got uh, sickness in the world. Uh, they prepared before, during, and after war with medicines and different ceremonies. Um, and they did help the women uh, prepare uh, gardens by leading in those ceremonies that had uh, to do with harvesting, which was planting and harvesting, which most of them did. Um, Cherokee women were the leaders of the homes. They took care of the gardens, took care of the children. Um, Cherokee women were always consulted about different things. Uh, they were spiritual leaders, they were doctors, uh, and they carry the rhythm during our ceremonies with the turtle shell shackles. So women were um, 
and still are very important and very revered among Cherokee society. Um, medicine people, um, for lack of a better term, medicine men, uh, uh, there's not very many of those people left and the people that are, are, are left um, usually tend to keep it fairly quiet. Not everybody knows those things and those things are usually passed on uh, through families. Uh, we believe in different messengers and helpers, uh, birds, Cherokee spirituality are always been considered messengers, Ani Atawe, which are the wise ones or the helpers. We believe in different, you know, spirits and guardians uh, of nature and different things. Our ancestors are a big part of helping us and the spirit of the creator within us. Um, some people might call it a conscience that tells us what's the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. Um, we hear a lot of people, things mainly from non-Cherokees about Cherokee names. Um, there were traditional naming ceremonies uh, within four days of birth. Uh, the family would go to water and then the name uh, would, of the child would be given by the grandmother um, of the mother or the oldest woman in the mother's clan. Um, our child rearing practices were um, a little bit different back then. Uh, the man in the relationship to help raise their nephews and nieces uh, because they were of the same clan as their nephews and nieces and they passed along uh, specific clan beliefs on them. Uh, the father was in the children's lives but the major teaching came from their uncle and this being because the uncle would, be, would have been of the same clan as the children were. Uh, the women, uh, children, boys specifically taught by her brother, clan specific information was, was passed on by the women to other women, uh, to their female children about how to be a Cherokee woman. Uh, wedding ceremonies and divorce among Cherokees. Uh, man, there were ceremonies. The man moved in with his, his uh, wife and her mother's family. They would usually build them a house close to uh, the wife's family. Uh, the literal translations of husband and wife uh, in Cherokee, the one that cooks for me is the wife and the one that lives with me is the husband. I always thought that was really uh, funny. Uh, to divorce uh, was all up to the wife usually and uh, she could just put her husband's stuff outside um, if she wanted him to leave. We had several traditional games that were involved in ceremony, the main one being stickball. Um, stickball was used as, as conflict resolution. Uh, no, we would wish we could just do that today, get out and uh, play a stickball game and solve all of our conflicts. Uh, but it was used as an alternative to war uh, and stickball as it was played uh, traditionally for Cherokees was a ceremonial game and at the ceremonial grounds is still a ceremonial game, although you see social uh, stickball games being played as well. So I'm getting close to the end here. I always like to leave some time for questions. If we have questions, I'm not going to promise that I know the answers to all these questions, uh, but I will try my best. So a couple of Cherokee prophecies to end here. Uh, when we are close to losing everything, if we are right, we will get it all back. I don't know about y'all, but I feel like at certain points in the past 20 years, um, we've been close to losing everything. Uh, we're, we're trying to make strides to keep our language alive. We've been close to losing, losing that. Uh, there's not very many you know, ceremonial grounds anymore. So there's not very many, uh, as many people. Um, I'd say there's probably more people now that come to ceremonial grounds than there was 10 or 15 years ago. So there's kind of been a resurgence of that. But the key to this prophecy is it says, if we are right. Um, and that doesn't, to me, that doesn't mean if this prophecy is right, that means if we're doing things in the right way, um, if we are following 
our Cherokee community values and following uh, that do you to following that path. If we are right, uh, those things will come back to us. And some things have came back to us um, in recent years. Another one says that we are to return home. And this is the part of the presentation where I usually get choked up. Um, if you have not returned home, if you have not been to uh, Gatua, to the mound, to Cherokee, uh, to that area that we call our homeland, I would, uh, I would say that you should go. Uh, the first time I stepped on the ground there at Katua, I felt at home in a place that I had never been before. And uh, so I would, I would definitely encourage everybody to uh, go back. If you're not from Oklahoma and uh, to you, you know, Tahlequah is the homeland or Adair County or wherever your family is from, I would encourage you to come. Um, you're all invited here and you're all invited to, to come and see uh, this place that we call home. And so uh, I just wanna encourage everybody uh, to, to do that, to come home, whether, whatever that might mean to you. So what remains today? What can we practice? And again, if we are right, it will all come back to us. So what remains today of our spirituality is uh, definitely the ceremonial grounds. That's a big part of it. But it's also those Cherokee community values that we can practice every day uh, to treat one another as sacred, to hold on to one another so tight that if one of us falls, we all fall and we all struggle to get back up together. Um, those are the things that we can practice today. Um, there's many, many more um, that I try to go by each and every day in my life. Um, and it's difficult. It's difficult to follow that, that path because there's so many conflicts and there's so many distractions of everyday life. But uh, Again, it says if we are right, if we follow those things that our ancestors have taught us, if we follow those community values, we practice our, our ceremonies, uh, if we are right, it will all return to us. We'll all uh, be able to see a resurgence in our Cherokee beliefs. And I believe we, we've already seen a resurgence in our uh, Cherokee nation, our Cherokee tribe um, as so I believe there's enough people that are still doing this and still living in this way that uh, the creator is blessing us with a lot of these things, but we can always all improve, uh, treat each other right all the time. Uh, and I believe if we do that, like I said, a lot of our problems that we have here uh, in this world will disappear. So I thank everybody for listening to me today. Um, if there's questions, I'm gonna ask if Abraham would maybe look at the questions and read them aloud so that people can hear what the questions are and I'll try to answer them as best I can. Hello. Sure. What well, old Brad, I really appreciate that presentation. Um, you know, that's really awesome as, um, you know, somebody who attends the stomp ground regularly. Um, you know, I appreciate all that. You know, I learn something every time I hear you speak. So, uh, you know, I really appreciate that talk today. I think that's going to help a lot of people also who aren't able to make it back as much as they'd like to, you know, and attend ceremony. So uh, once again, Brad, that was an awesome presentation. I really appreciate it. So we're going to start off here. We have a question from Beth. Um, I can help you with this one also, um, Brad. It's if we are a matrilineal society, why is it that so many of the people we turn to explain our spiritual ways are men? Um, I think everybody has their own experience. I mean, I, I don't know that, I know that not all the people that I turn to for spiritual guidance are men. Um, I think it depends on, you know, who you know and who you trust. Uh, I, I definitely have women in my life that are, uh, that I turn to uh, when I have spiritual questions, Cherokee women. 
And uh, I think it just depends on who you have in your life. Just because, you know, I'm sitting here doing this presentation doesn't necessarily mean that all, uh, all people that have knowledge about Cherokee spirituality are men. That's just my take on it. What do you say? You know, exactly the same thing. I just wanted to, you know, um, reiterate the fact that you do hear from also cultural outreach. You know, we do have a lot of men um, on who do do presentations. Um, Donnie Squirrel also, um, you know, teaches a lot about Cherokee spirituality and, um, you know, presents on that, very, you know, often. So it may seem like that, but it's, you know, just it's really not the case. You know, my aunt, uh, Lula Mankiller is kind of the head of our family and is our spiritual leader, you know, along with my uncle Jim. And so, um, you know, you're definitely right, Brad, um, you know, in that it may seem like that, but it, it's actually, uh, you know, uh, a good um, balance of both. So uh, our next question is for Cherokee women who have a Cherokee dad, but a non-Cherokee mom, do you know how that impacts our roles in ceremony? I grew up at large, but I'm hoping to move to Tahlequah sometime soon. Um, at the ceremonial grounds that, that I've attended, um, I'm, I'm one of those people that doesn't necessarily have a clan. I, like I said, my grandmother on my mom's side was born in Pennsylvania. She was uh, not Cherokee at all. And so when I go to the ceremonial grounds, um, the chief or whoever's there, the Duyukta, one of those guys will tell me, you know, you sit, this is where you sit and this is what you do and just follow these guys. And usually it's in the long hair uh, arbor where they sit me and I'm not treated any different than anybody else there just because, you know, I don't have necessarily have a plan. Um, they'll tell you where to sit. They'll tell you what to do. Um, and it's not because they're trying to be bossy. It's trying to get you to do things in the right way. So you don't, you don't necessarily have to worry about that if you come to Tahlequah. And if you, you know, get with those women at the stomp grounds, they'll line you out. Uh, they'll tell you, tell you what you need to do and, uh, you know, how to do things the right way. So it's, it's not a, it is, you know, it kind of bothered me at first, but um, it's, anymore it's not a big deal uh, as much of a deal as i thought it would be what oh brad yeah that's a great explanation um from diana we have i heard my grandmother talk about going to water with her mother what was that well going to water is uh something that some cherokees did pretty much every day um, and all of our cherokee towns and villages were we're close to running water um, just for practical reasons and for spiritual reasons and basically going to water is a, a ceremony that uh, of cleansing uh, the only the only two people that i've well maybe th i've been to water with three different people usually uh, these days you have somebody you know leading the ceremony but in those days it would have been uh, the elders the, the, the grandmothers the grandfathers those sorts of people leading the family in the ceremony of going to water. And so I'm not sure that the ceremony a long time ago looked the same as it does today, um, but it's basically just a ceremony of cleansing. And it's, uh, like I said, the Cherokee people were a whole lot cleaner than their European counterparts in the, <laughs> the 1700s. We knew um, while they were still thinking that, you know, cleanliness was sin, we knew that cleanliness actually helped you uh, fight off diseases and helped your immune system and protected you. Uh, the water protected you in all sorts of ways. Uh, I've heard stories, you know, of, of people going to water, you know, Cherokee men going to water in, during World War II um, in Germany, you know, while they were fighting as a way of, of cleansing and protecting. So you can go to water um, anywhere there's running water and, uh, to me, you don't even uh, really have to have somebody to to lead you in that. It's just uh, uh, you just do it. You just go and you you know immerse yourself in the water. It's it's really strange um, when we talk about you know now we talk about Christian baptism and things like that, immersing yourself in the water. Um, it's really strange how all those things seem to 
line up. But yeah, going to water is just a, a cleansing ceremony. It's something that that Cherokee families did together as a family. What up, Brad? I appreciate that. Uh, from Alan, we have, um, he says, I am at large now um, and a novice in our ways. Could you um, talk a little bit about the place of the drum in Cherokee spirituality? Is that another sacred center like it appears to be for some other tribes? Um, I can speak to my experience. Um, the only drum that I've ever seen at a Cher Cher Cherokee ceremonial ground is called a water drum. Um, and it is usually, uh, it's, it's basically just a hollowed out piece of, of wood, a hollowed out uh, log that can be filled with water to change the tone and the pitch. Um, and there's a piece of hide stretched over it. The favorite type of hide to use was gopher hide because it was really stretchy and really tough. Uh, but I've seen deer hide on them as well recently. So basically that drum is, is just kind of an extra instrument to keep the beat. Um, and I've never, I can't say never, but I, I don't remember ever seeing it in the center um, I remember somebody setting off to the side in one of the arbors, you know, playing that water drum. Usually the only instruments that are used uh, in the center are the turtle shell shackles that the women use, that the women wear on their legs. And then I've also seen a couple different types of rattles uh, used in different songs at the center uh, by the, lead, the guy that's leading that particular dance. And so I've never seen the drum uh, be in the center and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but to me, the drum in Cherokee ceremonies almost seems like a secondary uh, instrument to the turtle shell rattles and shackles. Yeah, um, that's a great answer. Uh, you know, that's been my experience also. So what up, Brad, I appreciate that. Um, so that's all the questions that we have. We have a lot of people who've said what though. Some people have had to leave early um, from Joseph Warren. He said, what a great conversation and presentation. He is going to catch the recording. Um, yes, if you, uh, you know, know of anybody who wasn't able to see us live, I will post this on YouTube on the Cherokee Nation Community and Cultural Outreach YouTube channel. Uh, Brienne says what though. Brooke says what though. Uh, what though, you guys for joining us. Um, so, you know, once again, I just want to thank Brad and um, actually we have one more question. Brad, do you have time for one more? Yep. Uh, one more slipped in here really quick. So this will be our last question of the day um, from Hans. He says, traditionally, the long hair clan adopted captives, slaves, and other deserving people into their clan on behalf of the tribe. Is this still done today? Um, I don't know about adopted today but like i said when i when i do attend the stomp grounds because I've, i don't have a clan that's the clan that i usually sit with and and yes you know traditionally uh that clan would be the one that uh adopted most non-cherokees and taught them how to be cherokee they were the long hair clan was kind of uh, the keeper of the knowledge of the ceremonies and so yeah that they were the ones that that taught people how to be Cherokee, and that's the clan that I, the clan's arbor that I normally sit with, when I when I do participate um, at the stomp grounds, and I think that's just a, a carry, you know, a carryover from that old time of adoption, and you know I've never had anybody come up to me and say you know we want to adopt you into our clan, but uh, uh, you know because you don't have a clan, uh, maybe I'm just not lucky enough for that, but. Anyway, that's that's my experience. Um, you're asking about the arbors. He's asking about the arbors. The arbors are just the places where the people, the men, sit during the ceremony. They're usually, you know, just brush pole arbors with with benches in them. They're not made to be comfortable because you're not supposed to fall asleep in those overnight dances. They're just a place for you to sit. Um, and uh, most ceremonial grounds, you know, have an arbor. For each clan, uh, there's one Cherokee ceremonial ground that has four arbors. Uh, they split up between some of the clans, but yeah, the arbors are just a place to sit. What up, Brad? Um, 
Colleen says, we'll know for the talk. Um, a lot of people um, really enjoyed this presentation. Um, Willow says that every clan adopted people in the old days, as I've been told. So we'll know, um, Willow for that, um, for, that, for that comment. So um, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up here. Um, looks like a lot of people um, have a lot of really great comments and uh, really appreciate this presentation, um, Brad, as did I. Um, you know, like I said, you know, one of the things in Cherokee culture that I appreciate that is different than mainstream society is that I feel that we value everyone's experience. And, you know, we're a very inclusive tribe and very inclusive people. So, you know, I think if we get more people talking about their experience with Cherokee spirituality, that is needed. We need more people talking about it than less people. And the more people who are talking about this and sharing the knowledge, you know, because the knowledge belongs to all of us. You're totally right in that. And I think we, you know, we need to take every opportunity we can, you know, to to help each other and, and share this knowledge. So that's exactly what you did today, Brad. And, um, you know, once again, I just really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. All right, guys, and that's going to wrap it up for this presentation. Um, I hope you join us next week. And um, until we see each other again, guys, don't die, go hunting.